Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Saul, and welcome to Bugs and Stuff, uh, Macro Photography with me. Um, I want to start off by thanking Adorama for hosting this and for um, OM Systems for trusting me to deliver an hour of content. So this should be fun. Um, before we go to the next slide, I just wanted to go with a, uh, a little quote here. I live my life a quarter millimeter at a time. Um, that uh, old Dom, Dom Toretto, he was into macro. Um, I probably should have picked a more uh, recognizable Fast and Furious clip. But anyways, um, about myself, I currently live in the Washington, D.C. area with my family. Um, I was born in Wisconsin and moved out here a few years ago. Um, I don't do macro photography uh, full time. I'm actually an IT manager. Um, surprisingly, there's not a lot of money in bug photography, uh, especially in this economy. What bug can afford a photo session? But um, I, I probably would be if it paid the bills, but I do IT management full time and, and get out um, when I can and photograph. I've been doing macro photography for just a few years. Um, since uh, 2019, it's got here actually probably more like 2020. Um, <clears throat> but I was given some extension tubes uh, as a gift. I was interested in macro photography. I was given some extension tubes as a gift and they kind of sat in my closet for a while. And then the pandemic hit and I was looking for a creative outlet. So I decided to throw them on a, a 70 to 200 millimeter. Um, and uh, it was kind of this crazy, unstable bazooka uh, looking thing, but it got me closer to subjects that I'd ever been before. And it kind of, my interest kind of took off from there. It started with flowers and textures and eventually bugs. Um, so I was a prior full frame shooter. I uh, had a Nikon set up and I think you'll find a lot of the um, macro photographers that are, are kind of more well known or doing well for themselves. A lot of them did uh, start out uh, full frame because it was the gear they had. And then they kind of worked their way into testing the waters with macro photography. And um, then eventually, you know, they, they saw that there were other options out there. And um, I was looking for some, some specific features, um, specifically focus bracketing and stacking um, built in. And we'll get to more of that later. And so then I eventually moved to uh, OM system. And I, I bought um, a used uh, a used kit, super cheap. It was a EM1 Mark II and a 60 millimeter uh, M2 go 60 millimeter macro. And it was so cheap that um, I didn't have to sell off any of my full frame gear just in case it was a, mis a mistake. And I never ended up using the, the full frame stuff again. Um, a year after that, I became, or I was fortunate enough to be uh, uh, become an OM system ambassador. So that's why I'm here today. I'm super lucky to be in this position. Um, and it's just, it's so much fun and I love talking about it. So I'm glad they uh, trusted me to provide some content today. I have had some images published actually recently, uh, a few um, publications, uh, Asian Photography Magazine, they asked for a, a cover photo and a pro, pro uh, photographer profile, which is really cool. Cause like, I don't know, most people I work with don't even really know I do photography or this kind of stuff. So I was able to kind of show that off. And then um, <clears throat> some other competition I, competitions I've uh, placed in, they, um, they had some uh, spreads and some online publications and stuff. So that's pretty cool. And I, and I mentioned that not, not because I'm looking, you know, it's the street cred. Um, it's just because I feel like bug photography is really starting to gain the attention of a, a global audience um, more differently than in the past few years. And I think that's kind of because the capabilities of uh, macro uh, cameras are, is changing and it's evolving and we're able to do, uh, more at a, a smaller scale than ever before. And I really focus on uh, bugs and stuff. I tried doing leaves and some other textures and stuff for a while, but it was when I got into 
capturing an insect and getting the, the eye in focus with a single shot. And that's really what started to captivate me. And um, there seemed to be a lot of, I don't want to say demand, but there's just a lot of similar interests online for, for that kind of photography. So I just kind of honed that and, and went my way from there. Um, this is the only single shot other than some example shots you're going to see. This is a honeybee uh, from a hive that actually we had outside of our house. And um, I love this shot because I was shooting in manual focus and it was really a spray and pray scenario. Um, I was just hoping to be would cross paths with the sensor at about uh, 0.5 uh, magnification. And one did after, I don't know, 20,000 attempts. So moving on. Uh, so macro photography. So macro, some people are confused. Some people get confused. I think it's a more international uh, it's a definition. So macro photography is when you're reproducing something at a larger than uh, life size scale. So people say, well, why isn't it micro photography? Well, micro photography is a thing. And um, generally that's more if you're going at like 10, 10 or 20 times magnification, like microscope levels. Um, things you can't really can't see with the naked eye. So that's why it's called macro photography. And I love macro photography because it's it's extremely challenging. The, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Um, it's hard. You know, the first time uh, I went out with my extension tubes, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And it was just like, this is ridiculous. Like I couldn't get anything in focus. There wasn't enough light. Um, and just being able to learn new things, I feel like I feel like I'm learning new things from my peers, just from myself. And the more you put into it, I feel like the more you get out of it. Um, I I used to do. I, I first started with natural light uh, photography, and um, the images were I don't know. They just weren't up to my. I didn't like not having control. I didn't like what direct sunlight did to my images. And then that's when I kind of started with using flash. And then that kind of went into diffusing flash. And um, it, it was just a slow evolution that kind of got me to this point. Um, as I touched on earlier, there's a huge interest of, in macro photography because I feel like the images are, are changing. Um, there are it, certain advances with, um, mirrorless systems uh, that are enabling us to do more than we've ever been able to before. And <clears throat> I feel like there's gonna continue to be advances and we're gonna be able to do more. And it's really important though, because what we're able to capture now or what some people are able to capture now was really only possible with deceased or preserved subjects in the past. You used to need a, a macro rail um, something in a static environment. And now we can kind of, if you, you get it down, you can do it in the field, um, handheld if you need to. And it's really awesome. Um, we're going to talk about some, some sensor sizes a little bit. So I, I am uh, using uh, OM system, uh, OM1, and they're in the, the micro four-thirds system. And it's a lot different than full frame. Um, it has a lot of benefits, um, not too many drawbacks, um, especially if you're if getting zoomed in is, is your goal. Um, but that's something we're going to touch on a little bit, just so I can show you what the difference is and in, in how it affects magnification and things of that nature. Um, and macro is great, too, because there's so many different styles and subjects. Um, you know, it's not just about bug photography. Um, there's just so many. Uh, there's a good example is the uh, close-up photographer of the year competition. They have so many different categories. There's man-made, there's plants, fungi, slime molds, things. And it, really, you have kind of a limitless amount of subjects um, just outside or inside. Um, there's things you can do with water droplets. It's If you're looking for a creative outlet, macro is really the way to go. Um, especially if you don't like going outside or seeing people, I mean, not going outside, but traveling and stuff. 
So that brings me to what I really focus on, which is invertebrate portraits. Um, I don't really have too much to talk about on this slide, but I, I just absolutely love being able to go outside, um, see something from a distance with my my headlamp, notice that it's, you know, a, a pollinator or something that's kind of just chilling out, you know, in the middle of the morning and being able to lead a, a stick under it and it just kind of grabs on and I'm able to clamp that stick and I start to take pictures, it doesn't move and being able to just create images that it, it just, I feel like it gives it such a personality. Um, I mean, all these guys look pretty alien, which is why I put them together. But um, it, it just seems so different than a lot of macro I'd seen where you're getting a lot of single shots of things from a distance, from an angle. And I don't know, it kind of seems like these guys paid for the, a photo shoot or something. Um, but invertebrate portraits is, is like a, a niche within a niche, like, you know, macro photography isn't just about this, but photography just isn't about this. This is just kind of what I uh, focus on. But I also focus on, I do profile shots too. Um, I don't know what it is about me. I like the, the straight on and I like the perfectly, a perfect pro, uh, profile shot. Um, no, I wanted to share this image because uh, I currently, so I currently live in Maryland outside of DC. I lived in Virginia up until last year. The year we were moving, I needed to get up on the roof of our house to check something on the chimney. I don't remember. And at that time, my friends had known my yard as kind of this magical macro yard where subjects just randomly show up. And I was very fortunate there. Um, there it was a very thickly wooded area and random bugs and stuff showed up all the time. But um, yeah, this jewel beetle actually flew on me while I was on the roof, like landed on my pant leg. And so I saw it as a, a parting gift. Um, it was just kind of a nightmare trying to photograph without my wife figuring out. Um, eventually she did, but it turned out really well. And I also photograph stuff, um, bugs and stuff. Uh, I like, these are all frog eyes. Um, and I realized how similar they were until I got them on this, this uh, PowerPoint uh, slide. I actually like how the green of the one frog blends into the green of the middle and the brown. Goes, they're all three different species. Um, I'd go over the names, but I, I'd probably screw that up. But uh, no, I like, I like certain settings on my camera I like to keep. And I found that toad and frog eyes um, are perfect for when I'm doing when I'm shooting uh, at higher magnifications for other insects and, and spiders and things. So if I'm ever on a path or something and I see like a, t a frog jumping by, I'll see if I can approach it. And they're, the height of their eyes is perfect for the um, as you can 90 millimeter. Uh, I barely have to lift the end of the lens barrel off the ground and you can kind of fire away. And I know it looks like yes, I have a collection of, of frog eyes here, you know, these are three sets of focus brackets out of, I don't know, at least 50. You, you approach you approach a subject and they, they jump away um, or, you know, they, there's movement in the eyes or something like that. But just so everyone understands, you know, to get to be able to bracket um, or focus stack, you, there needs to be minimal movement. So for these three images, there really was no uh, movement in the eyes at all, which was, is kind of crazy to me. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah. And if you're curious about what the, uh, reflection is, so that's actually a reflection of my flash diffuser, which is circular, a Cygnus tech diffuser and, uh, my lens in the middle. So that's not like an additional pupil in there. Uh, you do have a question. Uh, these, these are, so these are focused uh, bracketed, and I'll get into the differences uh, there with the with OM system and how they kind of differentiate between those two because there are some general understandings of what focus stacking is. Um, but I I primarily because of the amount of frames I like to have, I usually uh, bracket and then I stack them myself. But we'll go over that uh, in a little bit. <laughs> All 
Ah, but before I get into it, this, so this is this is uh, very important. So with all types of photography, um, ethics is critical. So I'm not sure if it's because of just the limited knowledge with uh, bug photography and how images are captured and stuff. Over the past few years, there have been a lot of different kind of ethical things that have come up. You know, you, you'll find, we found people have um, uh, drugged their subjects. Uh, we heard people in the past when technology wasn't up to speed used to freeze their subjects. Uh, hopefully nobody is, is killing their subjects. Um, but a lot of people, I know even coming into, because I saw some of the pre-questions, a lot of people thought or assumed that these were all, you know, deceased subjects, because how can you get a focus stack or a, or a focus bracket, you know, on a living subject? And you can, it, it takes a lot of hard work. You, you have a lot of a high failure rate, um, but we'll, we'll get into that. They don't need to be dead. Um, and don't need to harm them. You don't need to put them into harm's way. Um, so you want to respect your subject. You want to respect the environment they live in. You know, if you see like a, a nest of something and you're trying to get to, you know, you're not, we're not destroying, we're not out here trying to destroy things or destroy, a, you know, a bug's home just to get a shot. You know, it's, it's not worth it. And that's something that is kind of understood amongst macro uh, photographers online. Um, also, it's important. You don't, it's easy to spot. A lot of people will try and make up a situation. They will put a, um, they'll photograph a deceased hornet with a deceased fly uh, in the general area. And, you know, they'll say that, oh, hey, I stumbled upon this situation, you know, this, this, uh, um, this thing that was going on. And it's to the untrained eye, you know, maybe sure that's passable, but most of us, you know, we understand how, what kind of shots are possible. If you're stacking two different subjects, then it looks like there's a lot of, it's a, a situation where there's a lot of movement and stuff. It's, it's easy to spot and it's just, it's not worth it. It's never worth it because you will come into a situation, you know, if you're out there enough, you will, you will see these environmental type shots and be able to take those shots. And it's just, it's just never worth it because I don't think, I mean, no one's ever admitted to it, but I don't think a shot like that has ever been passable where someone hasn't been like, Hey, what's going on here? Um, also try not to, we don't want to mislead our audiences into thinking that a deceased subject is actually living. Um, even I don't have an issue with ethically sourced deceased bug photography. Some of the greatest photos I've ever seen have been, are these high magnification um, shots of, of, bugs that uh, were ethically sourced um, and shot in a, a, a static uh, uh, environment. Don't, it, it's just not worth it. Um, it's not worth it to, po to put something like that, a subject like that on a flower, start moving the legs around to try and make it think like it's sleeping there or it just came up. We, you can always tell, um, it's easy to tell. And it, it's really just not worth it. Um, I don't know why you would do that. I know that it's hard sometimes, it's hard to get uh, specific shots and specific things, but it's just never worth trying to mislead your audience about what is or is not possible with macro photography and bug photography. Um, and going along, don't lie about the situation. Um, we, uh, I, I've, I've approached people online. Other people I know have approached people online. Um, we can tell, like it's easy to tell if something is not right about a photo. And I don't know why it happens so often with macro photography and bug photography, but it does. Um, you don't you don't need to lie. You don't need to make up a situation. It's just not worth it. And be open with your editing. Um, that specifically, like I have often, you know, a, a, a bug is a great subject, but it's it was missing a leg or something. I will always put in the con in the comments, like if I cloned a leg from the other side just let just let your audience know let let people know like that's what you did no one's if it yeah if it if you thought that the, the missing leg affected you know the overall image yeah put it in just let let people know i've seen people completely clone the half of a a face like a mantis face and put it on the other end and they don't tell anyone about it and it wasn't even done properly because the whole face got squished in but it's like 
I understand if there's something damaged on the other side, you know, just, just let the audience know about it. Be open with your editing and I don't think anyone will, will have any problems with it. All right. So what's in my bag? Um, so I'm currently using the OM system, OM1. It's incredible. I have it right here. Actually, here's my full setup. Um, this is the Mzuiko 90 millimeter uh, 3.5 macro IS Pro. It goes to two times magnification. Um, I don't use it as much anymore, but my workhorse used to be the 60 millimeter macro. I just got the 25 to 45 millimeter for more wide angle shots. Um, I'm still working on, on that. I took a couple shots of a toad the other day and it was great. I just got to get, get used to, um, get used to the working distance and, and what I'm going for there. So the Raynox DCR 250. So that's actually that little circular thing you see on the slide. So that's a close up lens that this, uh, I believe is a eight plus eight doctor lens that um, it increases, it lets you get closer to your subjects. It's a highly calibrated uh, piece of glass. It, it does affect image quality, not really a considerable amount. And I don't use it with my 90 millimeter anymore because I don't need the extra reach or the extra magnification, but I used it with my 60 millimeter. And I felt that um, if I remember correctly, it kind of turned the uh, one times magnification lines into more like a 1.5 or so. Um, there are a lot of variables in that. It's not exact, um, but that's what that's used for. And I still carry it with me just in case. Uh, for flash, uh, I'm currently, so I have a high power, high uh, quick recycling time requirement for how I capture macro photography. So I currently am using uh, the Godox V860 free. Um, uh, if you, it's, if you need something, if you're going out in, um, the jungle, if you are from an area with a lot of inclement weather, um, the OM system flashes are actually like weather sealed. This, uh, is not, um, that I'm aware of. So the, I have used, uh, the, the 900, um, it was fantastic. It's just, I needed, I shoot a very specific way. And until um, they come out with something that recycles a little quicker and longer, um, I'm using the, the Godox. Um, so that thing you see there, that piece of plastic, um, is the highly engineered piece of plastic, actually, even though it doesn't look like it, is a flash diffuser. And that's made by Cygnus Tech. Um, he's a, a, a great man uh, from Australia. And what this does is this provides soft, um, strong, but soft and even lighting over your subject. And there's there are a few people that make uh, diffusers like similar abroad and in the US. Um, I just prefer uh, Cygnus Tech because you can fold it uh, flat in half and put it in your, your camera bag. And it's just so easy to like to open and close and take uh, for traveling. Um, but it, was, it wasn't until I got the diffuser on my flash that I started seeing images like how I wanted to see. I tried making my own diffusers, did not go well. I tried the Pringle Scan diffuser. Um, and then I have like a mag mod and some other things. They can get, they can get plenty of light on your subject. Um, it's just the quality of light isn't really what I was looking for. Um, I like a wide dispersed uh, light. So that thing really took my macro photography from like, oh, I think I kind of like this. Oh, wow, I really actually like this. Um, so I go out at night or in the early morning, most in the early morning. So I have a really strong headlamp. I say strong headlamp because you need a concentrated beam. You don't need a concentrated beam, but a concentrated beam will actually help you see um, spider eye. And I don't know if that's something you want to see, but something I didn't realize you can twin, you can shine your your headlamp in a, a the floor of the woods, and it's just twinkly all over. So that can actually help you see subjects from afar. Um, it'll actually help you uh, see silhouettes of things and stuff um, that you wouldn't normally see with something that wasn't as strong. I also have a clamp, which is that little bendy arm you see there. Um, and what that does is it either it, it'll help me hold like a stick 
or a branch up if the subject's on it. Um, I also have a little magnetic arm that I use similarly uh, to that. And it's on like a metal base plate. But I have two that I use in conjunction because sometimes I'm sick of the black background and I'll stick a uh, color background card, which is my next thing, behind a subject. Um, the color background cards I have a love-hate relationship with because usually they make cleaning up um, and post-processing a little harder. Uh, but sometimes the black is just a little mundane, uh, which is what you get when you're shooting at night. Or sometimes you can get black backgrounds if you're shooting during the day. There isn't a lot of ambient light and you're using flash. So that's why that honeybee you saw at the beginning, it was actually in the morning. It was in the shade, um, but it was definitely light out and I was using flash. So the flash is what primarily illuminated the, bee, the honeybee, which is why I was able to freeze it the way I did. So I think the shutter speed was only one 200. <clears throat> All right, so as mentioned, I uh, use Ohm system there in the micro, micro four thirds system. I used to use a Nikon full frame um, Z7, and that's 45 megapixels. So the image, so this is all uh, theoretical. Um, this isn't an actual full frame image. This is a, a stack I did on Ohm system, but uh, for demonstration purposes, the image on the left is the area, the entire image is the area um, of a full frame sensor. The image in the little rectangle and the cropped image on the right is what a micro four thirds is compared to a full frame. So this is important because a lot of the lenses that you'll see for OM system will be, you know, uh, a, a one to one or times one magnification or times two really what it's looking like on the end, other end, because this is a two time crop factor is twice that. So a one X magnification lens on OM system is actually gonna look more like two X um, or the 90 millimeter is a two X and it looks like four X uh, as compared to a uh, full frame. So it also affects depth of field. Um, so you should be getting similar depth of field um, with a zoomed in. So, so the depth of field on these two should be the same. If you took a photo at one times magnification with the full frame, and you take a photo with one times magnification um, with the micro four thirds, you're gonna get different looking images, but the depth of field should be similar. There are a lot of variables in that, like minimum focus distance and um, the focal length of the lens and such. But theoretically, um, that is how that affects. So if you like single shots, if you like getting more in focus per shot, um, you should be able to accomplish that more with a smaller sensor, with like a micro four thirds sensor. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't make great small images on full frame. You know, I did it for a year or so. It's just now that I'm using this setup and I'm able to go at such high magnifications, um, I'm just able to get in closer than I ever have before. And it takes a lot more work because a single shot, and I'll show you in the next slide, I believe a single shot at high magnification doesn't really look like much. Um, but it's definitely worth it to me. Um, another thing I want to hit on real quick, you could you could say, well, why would I get micro four thirds when I could just use full frame and crop? Well, that's, that's what I used to do. I completely understand. Um, in order to get the same amount of pixels, because this is often a complaint with micro four thirds, so it's only 20 megapixels. In order to get the same amount of pixels um, that you would need after crop as you get with uh, the micro four thirds, you would actually need a, a 76 or 77 megapixel full frame sensor uh, for the pixel density for how much you're actually getting in that smaller area. And well, yeah, okay, well, you could still crop down and it's still, you know, well, what if you want to crop even further? You know, and that's when you kind of run into, I've, I've cropped very, very small on my full frame. And the ending result is something that is just, you lose a lot of details and stuff. Um, you can still do it. But I'm just, I just want to put that out there. You know, well, it's only 20 megapixels. Well, yeah, you're, you're getting a lot for your 20 megapixels. Um, so let's get on to 
focus bracketing and stacking, but also I want to go to depth of field a little bit too. So this image here, the image on the left is a single frame when I was at two X um, on the, the 90 millimeter and the uh, kind of zoomed in crop in the middle is, is just a, a little bit closer look. So that's single frame and that was at F8 and you think you get a lot of depth of field in F8. So I'm so far in F8 really still isn't much. I'm getting a little bit of the eye and then that little uh, dew bubble on the left there. What's the difference? Well, with OM system, they're actually two very different things. Um, generally speaking, in macro photography, people will ask if something is stacked. And what they're asking for is, if, is this multiple images put together? Um, with OM system, yeah. Oh no. Oh, sure. Yeah, no problem, no problem. So um, yeah, just quickly. So the image on um, the image on the left is a single shot and the image in the middle is just a zoomed in um, version of that. And you can see that a single shot, even at F8, um, doesn't really get you much when you're at such high magnification. And then this is 2X on the 90 millimeter. Um, but what looks like 4x uh, on full frame. So in order to get more, uh, you can focus stack or focus bracket. And uh, generally speaking, in macro photography, people will often ask, well, is this a stack? So what they're asking there is just if images have been put together um, to, to create a kind of a, not a composite image, but in order to get that depth of field. Um, with OM system, it's actually two very different features that they have with uh, built into their cameras. So um, focus stacking with OM system is it will actually take up to, with the OM1, it'll take up to 15 images for you. And then it'll actually stack them together in camera and it'll, the end result will be a JPEG um, of the up to 15 images that you wanted it to take. And it doesn't have to be used in just macro. Um, you can use it for landscapes and things of that nature, um, but it's awesome. And I don't use it because the limit, I don't use it very often, is because the limit is 15 images, um, and which makes sense because the camera has to do a lot with 15 images, you know, in, in the body of the camera itself. Um, so focus bracketing will allow you to take up to 999 images. Um, and that's the main difference. Oh, well, the main difference being then you have to stack them yourself. You have to use software, post-processing software. You have to upload all of the images and then combine them yourself. The uh, stacking will actually, you have the option to um, get all of the RAWs. If you're a RAW shooter or if you just want to try a stack and see if it works, um, it actually saves all of the, the RAWs from that for you. So you can try stacking it yourself too. If it's a, if it's a scene that you really want to get and the you know, a fly flies away or something right afterwards, um, but for some reason, you know, the stack didn't turn out in camera, like you can do it, you can give it a shot yourself. Um, <clears throat> so why do it? Well, because if you're trying to get as close as that, as, uh, that wolf spider there, um, you're really not getting much with a single frame. Yeah. I, I could have pushed it, you know, this, this lens is still sharp at 14, you know, it's still not going to be much. Um, when can you do it? You need a still subject. And I'll talk about approaching subjects in a little bit. I realize that I'm talking a lot more than I thought I'd be, so which is good in a way, but also I should probably pick it up a little bit, but we'll talk about that. Um, and how do you do it? I kind of explained that a little bit. It's just, a, uh, I'll show you some menu screens in a little bit here, and we'll kind of go over um, how you would approach that. So when I was on full frame, and I hope that GIF is, GIF is working for you there, I would do manual push stacking. And um, so what you do there is instead of the camera being able to do it internally, like OM uh, system can do with uh, a certain number of their cameras, you would kind of just take a photo, inch forward, take a photo, inch forward. And that's how I started. 
it took me about a year of macro photography to trust the process of stacking or to enjoy it because none of my stacks will work out. Um, kind of call it falling with style. I'll buzz light you because that's, you're just kind of letting your body take over depending on how fast you're going um, and just staying kind of steady in a straight line for that. Um, and for these kind of things you do manual focus is, is key because you need to move that focus uh, down the planes of your subject on your own. And one of the benefits of doing it this way, as opposed to the in camera is that it is the same magnification because the OM system, when it's focusing in camera, you know, it's, it's changing focus down the road. So you're getting a smaller image as you go. Um, and, and so with both of these, you know, I kind of like to situate myself on the ground for stabilization. Uh, you can see the second little stick figure there is what I'm doing in the GIF is now with the OM system, I'm just kind of sitting there, um, stabilizing myself, turning myself into a, a, a tripod. I have my elbows resting on my legs and I'm taking deep breaths and I'm just trying not to have the subject move around too much in, in my frame. A lot of my peers um, uh, don't like using the live view, and which makes sense because you get more stabilization if the camera is actually on your face. I just like certain angles. I feel like I can't get low enough um, if I'm if I'm looking through the camera that way. So this is how I I do it. Um, another way to uh, stack is. Um, well, with OM system, another another good way to focus bracket when you don't have to worry about stabilizing yourself too much is how I captured this shot of this moth. And I actually rested um, the branch. You have your camera out and you're, I was able to rest the branch uh, just on my, on my arm. And it doesn't matter in those situations. It doesn't matter how much you're moving because it's moving with you. And that's the same if like you grab like a, 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 limb of a tree or something or like a thin branch there's a subject on it if you can set that lens you know on the end and as long as you're all moving together um you don't really have to worry about stable stabilizing yourself too much <clears throat> oh i do want to mention this was also where the term uh unicorn stack came from uh which <laughs> post-processing uh can be very tedious with stacks and very rarely will you put all the images through and get something that doesn't require touch up on the other end. Um, this is one of those ones, all the different focal planes were kind of so close to each other and it was a, a dark background that I didn't have to do any cleanup. So we call it a unicorn stack because it's so rare. <clears throat> Ooh, this one here. Okay, so another thing I wanna to touch on, and I don't know if you've been looking at, I don't know how big it is on your screen. So. My shutter speed through most of these, other than the single shot of the B, has been 150. And 150 seems pretty slow. Um, it is pretty slow. So the, um, the camera I was using uh, up until a few months ago was actually the EM1 Mark II. And with focus bracketing, um, the, sync, the fastest sync speed was 150. So I got, I got used to it there. And then when I move to my OM1, it goes up to uh, 1 100, I believe. And I'm still at 150. This is with the 90 millimeter and the OM1. When you are shooting um, at such close distances, and especially with not a lot of ambient light, um, and let's say not on a windy day, the fact that I'm going out in the middle of the morning uh, with, with no ambient light, my flash is my shutter speed. So the flash duration, which I believe, I mean, it can go up to like one twenty thousandth of a second, I believe, at the, low, the lowest um, power setting. So the light hitting your subject and bouncing back, hitting your sensor is really your shutter speed. So you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, no, 150, you're going to get um, movements, not going to be sharp. I'm making the, you know, the, my, the sharpest images I ever have, and I've stuck to 150. So... If I was going out in the afternoon or midday, I would definitely boost it up to 100 because I feel like the ambient light would affect that a little more. Um, but I did want to mention that because I do get that. Uh, I do get asked that often. Also with this, you'll see this is a 23 frame stack. 
And the wolf spider I had was like a, was 112. So depending on the magnification, the amount of stacks you need or the amount of frames you need in the stack is going to change. This was probably at uh, one, 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 because I tried to get more in the body of it originally. Um, so I'm not going to need as many frames. But when you start to increase the magnification, you, you need more frames. You need to cover more ground. Um, someone asked uh, a question, can you do this without flash? You can, absolutely you can. Um, there are some great photographers out there uh, stacking without, uh, without flash. It does though require um, faster shutter speed and more stabilization. So um, you, you, you can't really do it handheld unless you're really uh, zoomed out, I would say. Um, and, but having a tripod or being able to set your camera on something or, you know, the end of the lens on something, you, you can definitely do it that way. Or even, you know, if you like, if you want to do like flowers or, or um, bigger subjects, you could set your camera on like your camera backpack or something. And that will, that will suffice as well. Um, in those scenarios, I like to do have the screen um, set. So you type, you tap the screen uh, to start the, um, the bracket so there's no movement at the beginning all right so this is a, a brief thing i ripped all these Im images from om systems uh website so thank you for that team um but this is kind of what the uh settings are like this is specifically for setting up focus bracketing starting in the the top left and then moving over to the right sorry i shouldn't number these and then the bottom left and then the um the the uh bottom right but you go into the bracketing settings and for this it, you can either turn focus stacking on or off. If you turn it on, then it's going to give you um, the different uh, focus stacking options. If you leave it off, then it's going to do a focus bracket for you. So when you turn it off, you'll see in that second, the top right, you'll see number of shots. That where, that's where you can set up to 999 shots. The, the focus differential is the space between that the camera calculates the space between each frame that it's going to take. The higher it is, the more space that there's going to be. Um, for the longest time, I think I was at a three. And then uh, I really worked on my stabilization and um, my flash speed increased, my shot speed increased, and then I went to a two. And most recently, um, I've been doing a lot of one stacks. It requires a lot more frames. Um, I've been in like the 100s, 130s or so. Um, it requires a very still subject, um, but I feel like I'm getting more detail than I ever have before uh, with that smaller focus differential. The charge time you'll see there is critical for flash users. So that's how much time um, the camera should be set to wait for the next shot. So you can set it at, um, I think it's zero seconds and it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. And then it goes from there, if I recall. Um, but if you, wanted, if you wanna do a stack, if your camera can recycle, uh, you know, two frames a second, you would set it to 0 0.5. If your camera can recycle, you think uh, at lower power, you know, five frames a second, that's what it's doing for the longest time would be, you know, 0.2. And uh, recently now I've just been firing as quickly as possible because this, this flash will last for a long time. So I've been doing uh, 0.1 um, or I, I think I have it at zero, but I, I'm pretty sure it's still about 10 frames per second. And then the GIF you'll see there is actually what it looks like. Um, so that's a focus stack. And um, I don't have the resulting image in here, but I just want to show you that took 15 frames in about a second. Um, and then it goes right into the, the busy mode and it takes about, I don't know, three, four seconds. And then it gives you a resulting stack image after that. It's pretty incredible. Um, and not just the really expensive bodies do it. Some of the older bodies and I, even their tough, uh, the tough cameras can do that, which is really cool because those things are indestructible. Okay. So we had a lot of questions about well, all your subjects dead, you know, how are you photographing? How are you making them stay still? Um, so let's get into that. So first, uh, finding subjects. I love using the iNaturalist app. Um, I don't know if that's a global app. I'm pretty sure it's in, it's in a, a lot of countries. I don't know. Maybe it's just US-based. 
but you can go to your location and you can just explore and anybody's observations that they've had a picture that people have helped identify it will it will show you a general geographic area so if you're looking so especially for a, a bug photographer well i want to see a six spotted tiger beetle you know you can look at parks and things where they've been spotted and um it's just incredible and then and I need to get better at this. You can even record your own observations and it has like a reverse image lookup in it. And it'll tell you what, what it thinks it is. It'll put it out there and then people, real experts will be able to come in and agree, disagree, give their own suggestions. So you'll be able to get an idea on that. Awesome for me. I'm terrible at ID, uh, the insects and spiders and everything um, to the point where I don't want to say I've given up, um, but I, I try and get the common name and sometimes I'll go a little further into that. Uh, and that's about it. But what you learn though, uh, after trying to stack or going out and just having really awful shooting days or really successful shooting days is that the opportunities will prevent themselves. You need to know kind of when it's not going to be a good shooting opportunity. If you see a, a flying subject land somewhere next to you and it's dancing around, you're, you're not going to be able to get a stack of that. Um, if you're out in the early morning and you see a flying subject, but it's on the end of a branch and it looks like it's kind of just, you know, it's just hanging out. It's been there all night. That could potentially be a good shooting opportunity. And it might be worth trying to see if you can get it to cooperate with you. And when I say cooperate, what I mean is, you could potentially put an end of a stick like underneath the front of it. This is what I do very often. I'll say, I'll find a small stick. I'll, I'll put it under the front of the subject. And very often they'll just kind of slowly climb onto it. And then I have a subject at the end of a stick that I can put on the ground. I can clap and try and take some photos. And if it doesn't like it, or if it's just not vibing with me, uh, which happens, then it'll, you know, it'll leave. And that's, and that's that. Um, it, macro photography, it, you can become absorbed in trying to capture some exotic look, you know, a, a damselfly or something that's flying near you and it's landing near you and you can chase it around for an hour or so. And it's just going to keep doing that. And it's, it's worth being able to really start to differentiate between, Oh, this is a good stacking and, and shooting opportunity. And this isn't because I've saved a lot of time just walking past something and being like, Oh, that's cool. You know, but I'm, I'm not gonna be able to photograph it. So I'm going to look for something else. Um, I go out, I avoid active periods. So I, I mainly go out at about four in the morning. And I know that that's not something everyone can do. Um, for me, it's really the only time I can go out. I've got uh, three young kids, a uh, busy life. And so I'll get up before work, which starts at 6 a.m. I'll go out to my local park and I'll see what I can find. And I come back, you know, and see if I got anything. If you want to, if you really want to stack, um, I recommend trying to go out, you know, during the dark because that's that's when the subjects, most subjects aren't really active. Um, you'll also find in the springtime and then in the fall um, when it's cooler in the mornings, there's really, really um, those are the best times. And when I actually get most of my good shots for the year is when is during those cold periods, because in the cold, they're really not moving much. Um, and if you find them out and about and they're kind of stuck, or they're on the side of a tree or something and they'll take a stick. Yeah, you know, it's a great shooting opportunity. Just, you know, be be kind to the subject, put them back, you know, when you're done or, or as best you can um, and try not to spend a crazy amount of time with them because um, I'm, I'm sure um, they've got better things to do. Setting your camera before approaching a subject, this happens to me all the time. I'll find something really cool. I'm right in front of it and then I realize I'm just, um, oh, Hold on, I lost my mic. Can you still hear me? Oh, there we go. I don't know why I did that. Okay. Um, hold on, sorry, one second. That's upside down. Oh, what I was saying, I've approached subjects and got there and really, sometimes the windows window of opportunity is really small to try and get a stack or even a single shot in. And I realized all my settings are still from like when I had a long lens on or I was doing something else with the camera. So make sure you have everything set up before you approach. Uh, slow approach, slow movements. Um, sometimes you can get all the way down there and or to wherever you're approaching your subject because you do have to get close to get this kind of magnification. Um, 
and then you like you itch your you itch your head or something and then they fly off so they they definitely they're aware and they're looking for you know things like that to scare them off uh be cognizant of your surroundings don't uh i we i poison ivy everywhere um <clears throat> so i have to be aware of that don't try and take a photo of a wolf spider in the middle of the road in the middle of the night for now wearing reflective gear things of that nature um you just you really uh you can get lost in the process of photographing, especially if you're finding something you've been looking for for a while. So just make sure, you know, safety is key. Um, poison ivy and other poisonous uh, plants are awful. And also remember your ethics. You know, I mentioned, you know, putting a subject back, um, not doing anything harmful to your subject or to their environment, really just respecting nature and knowing that like you're, you are fortunate, you know, to be in that, in that presence and being able to photograph them. And, um, you're just really not, not trying to do anything detrimental to them, um, or where they live in flighty subjects. There are, um, so this, this happens a lot. I will spend five minutes finding a subject, um, getting into place at that point your heart kind of starts racing faster because they haven't moved yet you've aligned yourself with them and uh, four or five or maybe even like on this one i think it was 30 shots in um they just fail and this happens a lot um far more failures than successes in this kind of uh ph macro photography but it just makes it just makes the wins even that much better. Um, <clears throat> I did get a question: How do you deter moths from dive bobbing your headlamp? You don't. Um, <laughs> you get you get used to it. Uh, you just kind of accept it. And you, um, I had mayflies or something the other day, and it was so bad they they got like in between myself and the shot. Like it was. It was ridiculous. Um, also, it's a big problem if you're going into the woods at night. The amount of spider webs I collect in my hair is is not fun. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, oh, a question from my wife, I believe. What is your bear plan? Uh, yeah, we have had some bear spotted in our area, which they shouldn't be in our area. Um, and I don't have a bear plan. So uh, be loud, apparently, is a good idea. I touch on spiders, spider webs. Um, the spiders are great for beginner focus uh, stackers and bracketers. If you can find them on the ground or on the side of the tree, where they very often are, um, being able to set the end of the lens down on the ground or on the side of the tree really will give you a taste of, um, well, it, it gives you that extra stability, but it kind of gives you a taste of like what focus bracketing can be if you figure out how to stabilize yourself in other environments. Because, you know, I get my best shots um, when I can just plop the camera down um, and just hit the shutter and watch it go through uh, all the frames I need before the subject leaves. Um, Someone asked earlier, I think, how do I determine where to set up before uh, a bracket? So what I do, so I shoot uh, manual focus primarily. I have used autofocus, but I like having control over my magnification. And with the 90 millimeter, um, you need to pull the, the clutch back. Um, you need to pull the clutch back and it has the magnification listed there. And so I like to set my magnification. I usually try and max out because I'm just going for it all now. I set it all the way to two X and then I go and I pop it forward because it needs to be in this mode to do the bracket. Um, Cause this disables autofocus and the bracketing features. So you need to pop it back up. And then I kind of, I look through live view and I situate focus. Cause you can see focus, the focal point very clearly, uh, the, the focal point clearly when you're at that magnification and I'll bring myself out as close to the front of the subject where I want the bracket to start as possible and then pull it back a little bit just in case I'm a little too close. I have ruined a few brackets because I was too close to the subject and I missed like some things I thought that were important in the in the forefront of the uh, frame. So that's kind of how I, I set myself up. 
Um, and I even, uh, I think I posted a reel. No, it wasn't this spider. Um, but I posted a reel of how I kind of, it, you can see it, find it on my Instagram, of how I kind of set the camera on the ground or in front of my subject. And I just, I push the camera forward until I can see where I need to start and I'll start. And then I'll kind of watch it go through. And if I need to make any adjustments, I'll just adjust for the next set. Or if it's an awful stack and I realize I started way too far in or too far back or something, I'll just hit the shutter again. It'll stop um, this this uh, bracketing or stacking process. Um, do you have any uh, question? Do you have any suggestions of shooting moving insects? Um, yeah, so sh shooting moving insects is how I started. And that's fun too. You know, for me, it was really about trying to get the eye in focus. But what I recommend with that is not really worrying too much about magnification um, and getting as close as possible, but really just trying to capture the moment, capture the environment. Um, and what that'll do too is it'll, it'll give you more wiggle room um, to try and get more in focus. And um, with those, it's more of the environmental shot you wanna go for anyways. I have had some portrait type shots that are single shots, but those, I it was in the same scenario where I had to be pulled away more, less magnification, so there's more depth of field. And that was a scenario where I probably had to crop a lot more um, to get the image, the overall uh, aesthetic I was looking for. All right. So post-processing, and we only have a few slides left, so I'm gonna do it on time. Okay, um, not too bad. So post-processing, um, I have listed here Photoshop. So I use Lightroom mainly. There are a lot of good, uh, um, edit, there's a lot of good editing software out there. I use Lightroom where I bring all my images in and then I export them to Helicon Focus. And I think someone else was asking about that. You can uh, take a bracket, or bracketed images and stack them in Photoshop. Um, you do that by exporting them or bringing them into Photoshop as layers. And then off the top of my head, there's an auto align and then auto blend. Oh, let me turn my light back on. But um, the problem with Photoshop for me is that uh, my computer wasn't powerful enough to do more than like 25 or so frames. And sometimes I would start a stack and then it, it, I could tell it was gonna take like half an hour. And then I didn't know if it was gonna freeze Photoshop or not. Um, so then I tried a uh, Helicon Focus, which I've stuck with since that, because I had a 30 day free trial. But when you bring from Lightroom, you can bring in raw images. I think they get converted to DNG files, but when you bring them in from Lightroom to Helicon Focus, I think they get converted to uh, TIFF files, but um, you, you can bring them directly in and it's just so much faster when you have a dedicated software that all, all it really needs to worry about is how to com uh, combine those images into one image. And the GIF you're seeing there is what it looks like um, when it's actually putting all the images together. And it's much faster. <laughs> yeah, I sped it up because I didn't want a 30 second long GIF. Um, but it, it's a much slower process uh, than this but there's three different algorithms it uses. And, um, and there's an A method, B method, C method, and they kind of do different things and they help you focus on different acts. Some of it is more about detail. Some of it more is about getting things, um, everything in focus. So it's something that you kind of have to play around with to get a feel for. And then once I um, get an image, there are editing tools within Helicon Focus for like cleaning up edges and stuff, but I prefer to just do it in Photoshop um, also because if the software freezes at this point, you lose your stack. So what I do is I save it, it brings it back into Lightroom and um, then I'll just export to Photoshop. Um, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest tools to learn uh, for editing uh, stacks, especially high frame stacks is the clone stamp in Photoshop. And what you'll find is, and I'll show a little bit of that on my next image. Uh, what you'll find is when you have two planes intersecting and you're, you're trying to have them both in focus, when it captured the frame of, of this shot, I'm sorry, when you finally get, so, so you have two things that you're trying to get in focus and the frame, the camera moves down. When you get to the point where you're actually looking at this image, when you had this back here, 
the the out of focus areas of this in the foreground actually affect the image back here. So you kind of get this soft haloing or ghosting, I think uh, is the term we use. And so sometimes you'll do, you'll process a high frame stack and it'll be kind of this, this halo around it, or you'll have like, you have arms in front of other arms and you'll see there's just a, a, a amount of detail that's just not there. And it's not because the software messed up. It's because when you took those images, there was no detail there. You had, instead of having that back arm or that, that back uh, piece of the image, what you had was an out of focus area of what was in the foreground and which is bit, which was bigger. And then you just have nothing there. So the only way to really clean that up is to kind of clone it out from other areas of the image. And um, that's a, that was a learning curve for me. I didn't want to do it. Um, I, I, I just wanted to stack something, have it look great. And then, you know, send it to the presses. But that doesn't happen very often when you really are increasing frames. When you're in like the 20s, 30 frames and up, that becomes more apparent. But if you're doing a small amount of frames or if your magnific mag magnification is le uh, lesser, um, you don't have to worry about it as much. Or sometimes it's just so, it's not as, it's not noticeable enough to even be uh, uh, a concern or it may not uh, distract from the image at all. That's my big thing. It's like, well, does this distract from the image? Um, and if it doesn't, you know, I'll just, I'll leave it there. Um, as I mentioned, more frames, more problems. Uh, yeah, that's when you start getting like a hundred plus frames, um, you know, and you're not doing it in a static environment, little movements and things like that. You're going to have a lot of areas that either the, the, the stacking software just doesn't really know what to do with. You got to go in, you got to add things back. Um, a big thing with me is, you know, I have wolf spider legs like here in front of its face and you'll have these thick hairs that come through, but that's so much further in the image that's so much closer than the rest of the stuff that all those hairs kind of disappear by the end because it doesn't think that's the data I want to pull. So I actually, in the software I go, and then you you can select an image and then you can paint back the details you want, which is a really nice thing because I, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how to do that well in Photoshop. Um, another editing tip that I like to do is in this um, damselfly with the pink background card is a good example. When I got this image uh, back and I stacked it together, this damselfly was pretty pink itself. You know, the colors kind of bled over and it wasn't, it just didn't pop as much as I thought it would. And my background card was pretty close. I recall wanting to move it back further. Um, but what I did though, is just, you know, I, I, use a tint brush, right? I work on high, on isolating the colors I want and then adding the colors, the opposite colors or colors to affect those areas to get the color that I, that I originally wanted. And I do that a lot. Um, and I feel like that's what really helped me go from like an image that seems like everything's a little yellow and the, you know, it's like, well, this bug was a lot more colorful, you know, when I saw it, like, well, yeah, you know, when you're taking photos in a confined space and like, it, you know, a lot of the, the color and stuff can get kind of mushed together. So I really like, I think isolated colors has helped me make images that pop a lot more. Um, and of course, ethics, again, you know, if if this damselfly was missing a leg, you know, and I put a leg back in it because I thought it distracted from the image, um, just kind of, you know, let your audience know wherever you're posting it. Um, just let them know, you know, Hey, this guy was missing a leg. I put him back. If you want to see the original, let me know. I'll send it to you. Um, someone asked, I'm guessing you always shoot raw for these editing. Yeah. So I, 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 even before macro photography, I was a big raw shooter. Um, I like the, the additional control you have, um, over the images. And sometimes another thing I didn't mention, sometimes what I'll do is if I really just had the lighting, completely wrong or or if it um something else is going on i will because the files are converted to tiff files so sometimes and because sometimes helicon focus does better i feel like when the lighting is uh when there aren't as many shadows and stuff i'll adjust the lighting on a single image uh, the exposure um i should say and then i'll copy and paste all over all my frames and then I'll bring it into Helicon Focus. I feel sometimes it helps me preserve details that would get lost if it converted shadows, uh, shadowy areas over.
All right, so here is um, a beauty of a moth. Um, here is an example. So that little area in the magnified area that I added. So that is what the image came out as from Helicon Focus. Now, this isn't exactly what the ghosting looked like. Um, what I did here was the ghosting came out further, even further than I thought it needed to. So I went in and I took a brush and I painted back some of the details pretty much as far as I thought I could go to where going in and then doing kind of a, 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 a patch or a clone stamp and then blending those two areas, which you can kind of see in the actual photo below. Really, it's easy to take care of that and kind of make it seem insig insignificant, like it wasn't really even an issue. But it was for some reason it's hard for me to find some examples. Maybe because my sh my shooting has changed. Um, but it used to be a much bigger problem for me having areas like that all over the place and just spending hours, honestly, hours in in. Photoshop and the other software programs just trying to clean up things because in my head, I know the image looked a certain way. I understand I'm trying to photograph it in a way, you know, that um, isn't how it was seen. It's not a real representation of how it was because you're including so many, uh, so much depth of field, you know, and then I'm just, well, I really want to clean this up to make it look like, you know, this is a more of a natural looking image. Um, Oh, another thing with this image um, and ethics is that, you know, this, this is a gorgeous moth. Um, and I, I let this moth, uh, I had this moth as a cocoon and uh, he emerged and then we released him at night to find a mate. I would never enter a moth like this. And I've had a few moths that I actually raised from cocoon um, into a wildlife competition, you know? Including even it was a little bit stretch, but I, that that bee that I love that I caught in flight uh, or captured in flight, I also want to enter that in a wildlife competition. Um, not everyone may agree with that, but the, the the situation behind it, you know, the environment I was in, how I you know I raised it, it emerged, you know, in my office, and it just doesn't. Even though as soon as I released it, you know, I was out in the wild or if I was not outside my house, you know, outside a hive and I saw that bee, I would probably count it as, as wildlife. But it's important to me to be transparent about um, where I'm capturing these things and, and how I'm capturing them. And I don't want people to think that I found, you know, this moth out in the woods and I was able and it was in perfect shape because when you find one of these guys, they're usually in rough shape already, even after a day. Um Excuse me. So just being transparent, you know, is really critical uh, with macro photography, just because it, for some reason, it feels like it's so easy to, to, I don't want to say dupe your audience, but to mislead your audience because so much about macro photography isn't really understood. Um, now, another thing I want to say, if you are looking for more in-depth um tutorials and how to stack specifically looking at the software seeing images being brought in and i think even um starting with doing a doing a focus bracket all the way to like the post processing and photoshop um on youtube jamie hall uh, hal definitive imaging he has a series of two videos that he did i think they're like an hour uh each they're fantastic uh i always had the idea to try and go through and make videos like that because i get asked about it often and I just, I, I don't have that kind of energy or creative talent. So he did a really good job breaking all those things down. Um, that's Jamie Hall, Definitive Imaging. Um, he's a fellow uh, OM system user currently living in Australia. So definitely check those out. Um, oh, I got a question from Tibor. Do you guys keep in touch? I'm assuming he's talking about the moth and myself. Unfortunately, those moths have a lifespan of about a week. They have no moth parts and they only live to breed. So, sorry. <laughs> All right, and that brings me to uh, my last slide, which is just the series of images that did not squeeze all the image details into. I'm honestly not even sure if you guys can see those in the first place. Um, but please, if you have any questions, 
Um, I know there was a list of questions that was sent and I felt, and it was a long list of questions. And I felt like I addressed a lot of them in this presentation. Um, it, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Instagram, I think is the best spot. Uh, my handle is at Ben's small world. Um, just reach out to me give me time. I'll go into the, my messages and, and I love answering questions all the time just because I love this hobby so much. And right now I'm being supported, you know, so well by OM system and uh, my, you know, my macro peers. And we just love talking about different approaches and software and, and everything like that. Um, and I, I want to, oops. And, um, and I just wanted to thank, you know, Adorama again um, for hosting this, for inviting me. Thank you, OM system um, for letting me uh, put this together. And I had a great time. And um, let me see. Actually, I'm looking at the chat if there's any other questions. Um, do, 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 do. The man is like, do. let me press buttons. Uh, ben, I love the blue. Oh, the blue backdrop. Uh, so that is a, oh, that is a damselfly. I don't know the exact species. And the blue backdrop, I, you, I normally just have like a, I have a set of macro cards, uh, backdrop cards. They're really just like, gradients I'll set behind a subject and that one worked out really well because you know it wasn't on anything like green it was on a, a dead twig and um yeah I really liked how those colors came together um Bill do you decouple the shutter button from AF um no actually um well when you set so that's a great question so even though um I'm shooting uh with the clutch up so to enable autofocus and the bracketing, I still have it set to manual focus. So I'm not, um, so I still have it set to manual. So I'm not using all the autofocus function at all. So I don't have to worry about it accidentally trying to find focus uh, somewhere else. So, but thank you everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here. I didn't really know how it was gonna go. And I thought it was gonna be like 20 minutes, but I see uh, we went over the hour. So that's fantastic. Um, but yeah, please feel free to, to reach out to me with any questions and um, take care. Thank you so much.